Hi guys, welcome to another uh, Monday night study. So tonight we're broadcasting on YouTube, Facebook, and Subsplash, which is the the um, the app and the um, um, website and uh, Telegram also. So we're continuing to do that just to kind of test things. Well, tonight what I wanted to do, I wanted to go through kind of a short study with you. Some of them are always long and some are short. It's just the way it is. But we've been talking about uh, the Exodus. Last week we went through some of the um, um, Egyptian text or secular text about uh, Egypt and figuring out who the Pharaoh of the Exodus was. And we found some really interesting things. So I hope you guys liked that. This week, one of the questions that came up was about, and it comes up every so often, was about um, lost books of the Bible, you know, and this idea that uh, we had a bunch of books and somebody decided to cut a bunch of stuff out, things like that. Now, the original autographs, I think all of us believe, were divinely inspired. What we have today are not the original autographs, so there could be spelling errors, copyist errors, things like that in some of the Greek manuscripts, and you can see slight differences uh, like that. But that's a, a different question as to whether some whole books were taken out or added or, or things like that. So I wanted to kind of go through this. So basically, the story that's given in just about every place, and by that I mean uh, the church fathers, uh, the places that I would look would be like the Talmud and other rabbinic uh, sources for Orthodox Judaism today. And then there's the church fathers, which would be the very early uh, fathers and, and what they taught, specifically those taught by the apostles. And then there'd be the Dead Sea Scrolls, so it'd be whatever the Essenes taught. And then there might be other things like uh, Jewish historians, uh, like Josephus, things like that. So basically, when we go back to that, you have the church fathers, the scrolls, the Sadducees, Pharisees, basically everybody, uh, telling the story of how the canon was closed in the time of Ezra. And we have that basic story in the Ezra Apocalypse, which is kind of funny because the Ezra Apocalypse is outside the canon, but it's telling you the canon was closed. But it's one thing that everyone understands. Now, we have 66 books in our Bible uh, the Protestants do. Other Orthodox and Catholic and other other groups will have other by other books in their canon, uh, one or two or a bunch. But one thing that we all agree on is the 66 books are our Bible. And we usually talk about the canon, like there's one. And really, we should be talking about the canons. There's an Old Testament canon and a New Testament canon. And by that, we mean is a collection of books that was started and then finished. So, for instance, if we start from the beginning with Genesis, for instance, with, which would be Moses, Moses is going to come along and say um, something along the lines of, um, I'm checking a couple things here, making sure I'm sounding right and for everything. Okay, um, but Moses is going to come along and he's going to write Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Now, who's Moses to write something like that? Well, he proves himself by being, you know, he says he's God sent him to deliver Israel and these things are going to happen. And then there's the ten plagues of Egypt, the pillar of fire, the death of the firstborn, traveling through the wilderness, all the different miracles that happen. And Moses or no human being can do something like that. So obviously the story Moses is telling is true. And then he you know, is told by God to write, and he writes. So the same with Joshua. Joshua goes in and does, so there are certain miracles that happen. In the time of the judges, there are certain miracles that happen. And there are prophets that raise up. And the prophets basically put these books together and, and create a canon. Now, a prophet is someone who is told of God to do something, and he has... Uh, gifts or powers from God. So, for instance, we remember Elijah the prophet uh, and the, the famous passage in Kings where uh, one commander comes and said, man of God, come down, you're going before the king. Come down or we'll come up and get you. Well, and he says, if I be a man of God, let fire come down and consume you. And that happens. 
and then you have the second commander of 50 comes out and finds him and and basically we consider him the stupidest person in the entire old testament to simply say man of god come down here or we'll come up and get you and but he's surrounded by 50 smoking corpses it doesn't make any sense but he does that and, and he says the same thing again if i am a, a a man of God, let fire come down and consume you. And that happens. Now there's 100 smoking corpses. So then the commander of the third 50 comes out. He's intelligent. He sees what's going on, possibly a believer. And he says, the king uh, has commanded me to bring you. If I don't bring you, basically it might be my head. Would you please come with us? You know, and it's, that's fine. You're not even showing respect to Elijah at that point, but to God and, and God-ordained authority. But point being is Elijah could do miracles. He's the kind of person that it's it's pretty obvious. Another passage I like about Elijah is at a certain point, um, the king wants his head, okay? And so he decides, God tells him, at this point, I want you to go before the king and tell him the following things. So he actually goes to Jerusalem, goes up to the uh, palace of the king, and the guard there, it's a guy named Obadiah. Later on, he'll become the prophet Obadiah, but right now he's just a king's guard, but he's a believer. And so he comes up and he says, I, have, I need an audience with the king. And Obadiah's reaction is priceless. It's like, oh, no, no, I'm not going to let you in because if I tell the king you're in my custody, and then he's going to say, bring him in, and I'm going to start to bring you in. The king wants your life. What's going to happen is that God is going to whisk you away like he always does. And then it's going to be my head. No, go away. You know, and then Elijah tells him, no, the Lord has commanded me to come here and deliver a message. So I have to deliver the message first before anything happens. And it's like, okay, you know, and the process happens. So that tells us several things. Everybody knew a prophet, and nobody messed with a prophet if you had half a brain. Uh, the king apparently did not. And another thing, whisk you away every time you get in trouble. To put that in Christian terms, every time someone tried to kill Elijah, he was raptured from this place to some other place. We see the same thing in the book of Acts. When Philip went to talk to the Ethiopian eunuch, talked to the eunuch, baptized him, and immediately the spirit had caught him away to another place. So things like that happen, and those are men of God. You know, so if I come online or, or someone else comes online and said, I'm the prophet, whatever, and you got to pay attention to me, and you got to give me a bunch of money, fine, prove it. Prove you're a prophet, and we'll listen to you. If you're a prophet, it should be really easy for you to prove yourself without hurting anybody. And of course, if someone says, I'm a prophet, I'm not going to come against them. At least they are a prophet. Um, and my attitude is like that because I'm a believer. I really honestly believe. But there's a lot of con artists out there too. Well, those stories kind of bringing it back to our study tonight about the, the lost books. So the prophets of old did things, proved themselves, made localized prophecies. We see Jeremiah and Isaiah giving prophecies to people local things are going to happen. It's obvious that they're prophets, so their books are added to the canon. So you have this continuation of books being added until the time of Ezra, when we're told by the Holy Spirit uh, in the Ezra Apocalypse that the canon is closed. In the Ezra Apocalypse, it simply says that it's closed to 24 books. And that shouldn't confuse us because we have 39 books in our Old Testament. The difference between the Jewish Bible and the Protestant or Christian Bible is just how we divide those books. So we have First and Second Samuel, it's two books. In the Jewish canon, it's just the book of Samuel. We have First and Second Kings, that's one book called Kings. We have First and Second Chronicles, that's one book called Chronicles. We have Ezra and we have Nehemiah. They have Ezra and Nehemiah. And then we have 12 separate books that we refer to as the 12 minor prophets. They have that as one book called the 12. So if you do that, it's the same exact books, the same about verses, the same information, 
but instead of counting it as 39 books, they count it as 24. And so it, it's just uh, the way they put the canon together. But the point is that we have that. So what's going to happen is, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the canon is closed. And then there's a prophecy later that during the Age of Grace, there would be a, uh, a new priesthood, Melchizedekian one, a new canon, new information, and that would be put together and then sealed. And so this is the concept we have. And again, we usually refer to the Bible as the canon, but the Bible really is the two canons, the Old and the New Testament. Testament is kind of like a canon or a collection of books. And so that being the case, we know there were writings pre-Moses. So you might even say there is a pre-Mosaic canon, which consisted of something. I mean, we really don't know much of anything about it. In my opinion, it would have been patriarchal writings, and we're beginning to get those back now. Um, it's entirely possible when the Lord comes back at the second coming, there will be another canon written about this is how it actually took place for the people in the millennial reign. Maybe, maybe not. But it would be interesting to, to finally learn that there were four canons. In either case, it's not important, but the, the point is the Old Testament canon is what it should be, and the New Testament canon is what it should be. So the time, the 400 years between the canons, is not, um, we, we shouldn't take those writings and try to put them in the Old Testament. People have done that, Orthodox groups, and I'm not slamming them or anything. Technically, the canon is the canon. Extra biblical stuff is extra biblical stuff. That doesn't mean that an extra biblical writing may not be 100% accurate history you know, from an eyewitness or something. It may actually contain a real prophecy. We know in the New Testament under Agabus, uh, he was a prophet. He ran the school of the prophets. There were other prophets that came with him down to see Paul. And so the gift of prophet or prophecy or the office of prophet was still going strong. Uh, and even if you think that that's capped or gone, we still had words of wisdom and words of knowledge, which are kind of similar but it's not to be added to the canon. And I think one reason for that is the whole idea that someone's thinking of becoming a Christian, they want to know a little bit about it. Reading 66 books is quite a challenge in and of itself. What if it was 660 books? What if it was 6,000 books, even if it's just little 10-page books? You know, as some people are going to say, I'm just doomed. I can't read it. I can't figure it out. It'll never happen. Just I won't even mess with it. So we have what we need. As Peter says, everything we need for salvation and a life and godliness in the New Testament. So in reality, all we need is the New Testament. But when you get to the New Testament, like you're reading Galatians, uh, for instance, if um, it says Abraham and Sarah and Hagar are symbolic or similar to teaching the concept of the covenants, etc. And, and I was to ask you, who is this Hagar guy? Or this, you know, is it a guy or a girl? Uh, who's Abraham? What, what, what kind of a thing is, I don't understand. I don't know anything about him. So if you go back to Genesis and read about Abraham and Sarah and Hagar, you understand enough to go, okay, I understand now what Paul is saying. So now we can go on. I'd like to know more about Abraham, but it's not important for say for Galatians. So it's that kind of thing that we're looking at. And then so we're looking at the scrolls um, and even what we consider Roman Catholic Apocrypha as being uh, historical, may or may not be prophetic, may or may not be tampered with. Uh, but in either case, we don't put it in the canon. The book of Enoch actually tells you that there is going to be a collection of works that the righteous live their life by. So that would be our canon or canons and that it is specifically not to be added to the canon. It is to be kept separate for people in the last generation, which is about now. So, And it contains prophecy and other things. So that's kind of important. And even Jude in the New Testament will quote Enoch. So obviously the Holy Spirit prompted Jude to quote it for a reason, so that we would know it exists and that it might be important at a certain generation. So really important to add that. So just because it's not in the Bible, in the 66 books, 
doesn't mean we just toss it out the window and never read it. But even if we find out it's legitimate uh, history, prophecy, something, that doesn't mean we add it to the canon. So we just, the Holy Spirit wants us to keep those things separate. So with that in mind, I wanted to look at the New Testament just a little bit and talk about the concept of canons. So, um, okay, just as a side note here, it's November, November. Wow, where did I go? It is April 11th. So April 11th is Monday. On the Essene calendar, it is the sixth day of unleavened bread. We had Passover always on a Tuesday, so it was last Tuesday. And then the week of unleavened bread. And then after Passover week is first fruits. Now on the Christian calendar, Gregorian, uh, this was Palm Sunday, last Sunday. And next Sunday, which is this one, will be Resurrection Sunday. So this time it actually falls, and the calendars are just different. They're just going to be slightly different each year, but they're going to be always within a week of each other. So first fruits, and then of course when we get to Pentecost, it'll be, I think, June 5th this time. Uh, yeah, June 5th. Anyway, I just wanted to kind of show you that so, so we can look at that. 2022, uh, this Sunday's Resurrection Sunday also happens to be first fruits on the Essene calendar. Because some of you have asked things like, well, it doesn't seem to fit. Well, part of it is because of the way the calendar is. Some years it will fit and other years it will not. And, and we're really familiar with that with things like uh, Easter um, on our Gregorian calendar because Easter is calculated from the moon. So it's the first Sunday after the first new moon, uh, full moon after the first new moon after the spring equinox, I believe is how it's calculated. And so it varies. It's March, April-ish, somewhere in there. Anyway, just wanted to share that with you. So it's kind of neat. So this is from our writing uh, on the patriarchs. So we've got a patriarchal writing. Remember what we were saying is that according to the Essenes, they say that the tradition of the elders, which is the Pharisee law, which is what the, the Bible calls the Pharisaical law, which is the tradition of the elders, was made up. And the reason they say that is because it contradicts what the patriarchs say. Now, what, what we're doing is the, the Old Testament is our rule and guide of faith. It's the one and only canon at that point. So it's the thing. You want to judge everything by the Old Testament. But when you get a, a phrase or a word, and there's a couple of different of ideas on what it means, the oral Torah, or tradition of the elders, say it means one thing. They're going to say that can't be because that contradicts the very clear definition of what this means in the patriarchal writings. And they said the patriarchal writings are the testaments, like a last will and testament, from Adam through Levi. So there's some 40 of these at least. And so some of them has been preserved in some of the orthodox places, uh, and a good amount of parts of them have been preserved in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So in this one, this is one of the testaments of, uh, it's the book, or the testament of Benjamin. Uh, Benjamin is a, uh, one of the 12 sons of Jacob. The apostle Paul is, according to the New Testament, a Benjamite. So he's of that tribe. So he's a good Pharisee at first, but he can't be a priest because he's not even of the Levitical line, let alone Zadok. So, but this is what it says here, and I just want us to, to look at this. This is pretty interesting. He's talking about several things, and in each one of these, it's like, I made the mistake of doing this, or I saw my brothers do this. Don't make the same mistakes. It's the same kind of stuff you would tell your kids. Drinking sounds like fun, but let me tell you what happened one time when I was out drinking, and you really don't want to go there, you know? And so he's giving all this good practical advice Part of the practical advice, of course, is to accept Messiah when he comes and understand that some people would reject him. And they give little bits and pieces of a lot of things. This particular place, so this is a Testament of Benjamin, chapter 11, it's a small chapter, says, I will no longer be called a ravening wolf on account of your ravages, but a worker of the Lord, it's, uh, the Tetragrammatron, the name of God, uh, distributing food to them that work that which is good. 
So Benjamin was called a ravening wolf, and we remember this back in Judges and in, in um, Joshua and in Judges, rather, the things that are going on as they come into Israel. And at one point, um, they have a civil war, basically. And they're very good fighters, very tenacious to win the war. The other brothers, the other tribes, had to almost wipe out the tribe of Benjamin. So Benjamin is known as a ravaging wolf. He'll take and destroy, and he's really hard to get rid of. Okay, and so we understand those things. So he's talking about in the time in the future, I will no longer be referred to as the ravaging wolf, but there will be a different ravaging wolf. It says we will be, or he will be referred to as a worker of the Lord, distributing food to them, which is good. One will rise up from my seed in the latter times. And I want to kind of put this together here. So one rises up from the seed of Benjamin, a Benjamite, okay, in the latter times. And this is why we have to look very careful at the definitions and understand the calendar. There's a beginning of an age and there's an end of an age. And the end of each age is called the latter days or the end times of that age. So the end of the last age was when the Messiah was to come, start the age of grace, and a lot of things happen. The end times or the end of the, the uh, last days of our age uh, takes place with a seven-year tribulation and Antichrist, and then the second coming of that same Messiah to set up the kingdom age. And so it's an interesting concept. So at this point, in the later times, of his age, because the first age ends with Abraham, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Jacob has 12 sons. They're in that age where the age of Torah has started, which is what it was called. So in the latter times of that, something will happen. So this is first century AD is when this should be happening, you know, give or take a century, but somewhere at the end of the age. So one rises up from my seed in the latter times, beloved of the Lord, hearing his voice on earth, enlightening with new knowledge all the Gentiles. So he's going to be a representative or a sent one, a missionary, an apostle, depending on how you translate it, to the Gentiles. So this is a apostle to the Gentiles. So this Benjamite, okay, he's going to be bursting in on Israel for salvation with the light of knowledge, tearing it away from them like a wolf and giving it to the synagogue of the Gentiles. And this is important because basically it's saying that just like Benjamin was ferocious and, and dangerous and, and would wipe out anybody that came against it, Paul was of the same mind. If this is right and that's wrong, it stops now. Nobody's going to do this? Fine, I'll do it because I care about the Lord. So he persecuted the church because he loved the Lord, thought the, the church was a cult. When he had his vision on the road to Damascus, who are you, Lord, he said. And the Lord said, I'm Jesus, whom you persecute. And I, I can just imagine, imagine yourself being the type of person that's going to do everything he can for God, finding out you've been dead wrong. And because of that, you have messed up big time. You've put the Lord, the real people of the Lord in prison. You've had some of them executed, you know, but instead of walking away, he still has a desire to serve the Lord. I'm wrong. I'm on the wrong side. Fine. I switch sides. And he continued to fight for, <coughs> excuse me, it's allergy season. He continued to fight for the Lord um, uh, with the same ferocity and talked to, you know, tried to take the concept of Judaizing away and going back to the Noahide, the, the Essene way, what Christ taught these kind of things. So this is what's going on. So this is the prophecy about him. But notice what he says. So he takes the truth and the light of knowledge and, and some new things too, and tears it away from the uh, Jews, which are rejecting Messiah anyway, and giving him to the Gentiles because he is, um, as it says here, 
uh, you know, tearing it away and giving it to the synagogue of the Gentiles. Now, the word synagogue is it's the same word in Greek as ecclesia, which we get church from. So it's a group of people, of believers. So you might have Noahides, which are Gentiles. You might have native-born and or converts to Judaism. Uh, maybe there's separate synagogues for each. Maybe there's a synagogue where they all get together. But it's like a church, okay? We might have a church, an ethnic church somewhere that speaks only that language. So I wouldn't go there often because I don't understand anything. You know, I would go to someone that, you know, speaks English. Um, maybe we'll have a service in both translated so we can all get together. But a synagogue, nonetheless, is basically a church. But this is telling us right now there's a synagogue of Moses, and that's the only way you can get salvation is by going through Moses, kind of, looking at these things, waiting on Messiah to come. There's a time coming when that will be broken. There's many prophecies in here about the Levites rejecting Messiah when he comes, Messiah setting up a new order with the Gentiles, a Melchizedekian type priesthood rather than the Levitical one. So at this point, then, he tears away the knowledge and everything from the Jews, in other words, the corrupt system, not the Jews themselves, but basically non-believers, so the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and gives it to the true believers, which is going to be done in a Gentile fashion. So it's going to be a Gentile synagogue or we could call it a church, a Gentile church, a Gentile synagogue. It's mainly Gentiles, because there's a lot more Gentiles than Jews, is the only thing. But it's going to be a ecclesia, called out ones from Jews, Gentiles, just anybody who accepts and believes in Messiah. So look at this. So he's going to do this. So what about this light and stuff? So if I have revelation from God, some sort of light, I mean, I could just tell you guys this, but I'm going to die one day, right? So I need to write this down. So there should be a written record of what happened to me and what I say and my teachings and that kind of stuff. So what happens here is, so this Benjamite does this, and he tears it away, and he gives it to the synagogue of the Gentiles until the consummation of the ages, so the final end of all the ages, so at the, very, at the very least, it's the next age. So that would be the end of the age of grace, which is coming quickly when the second coming occurs. So during this time period from the first coming of the Messiah to at least the second coming of the Messiah, there's going to be a synagogue of the Gentiles. They're going to have their own written canon or testament. And this Benjamin is going to have uh, writings in this. Now, notice what it says, until the consummation of the ages, he will be in the synagogues of the Gentiles. It can't be a guy because he's dead and buried. So his writings are in the synagogues of the Gentiles and among their rulers as a strain of music in the mouth of all. It's finally, we get to figure out the answers. It's got the answers of everything in it. And it's beautiful. It's musical. He will be inscribed in the holy books. So remember, the Old Testament is closed. So how is that possible? Apparently, there's a new canon or a new testament, if you want to call it that. So there's an Old Testament, and there will be a New Testament. His writings, this Benjamite, his writings will be in the New Testament. It's pretty interesting. Um, both his work and his word. What is the vast majority of the book of Acts? The book of Acts is the history of how the church started. And it begins with a lot of people, but the vast majority of the book is all about the Apostle Paul, who is a Benjamite, who, as he goes through the missionary journeys, writes several epistles to several churches, which, what do you know, are included in the New Testament. Pretty interesting. He will be chosen a chosen one for God, or a chosen one of God forever. And because of him, my father and Jacob, my father Jacob instructed me, saying, He will fill up that which lacks from your tribe. 
So this is interesting. Jacob had understanding of not only the age of grace and a lot of other things that are going on. And that's consistent with all the other scrolls talking about the age of grace and the changes that would come and, and other things. So there's a lot in here to study, but just showing you this, because in other words, there is a prophecy that the Messiah would come. And in another place, it talks about the uh, canon of the Gentiles would actually have writings of Messiah. And I'm thinking Matthew 24, for instance, t the Messiah teaching prophecy. So we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We have the book of Acts. And then we have a small section or a good amount of books written by this Benjamite guy. And then we have the general epistles, other disciples of the Messiah, and then the book of Revelation. And that's the canon as it closes. Okay, the New Testament canon. So with this, let me flip over to this. I want to show you a couple things. This is from our book, uh, Ancient Church Fathers. Um, so basically, we have the received text and the critical text, but it's basically Greek. And I wanted to share with this here. So we have uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Gospels. And then we have Acts, and then we have Paul's epistles and the other epistles. So this is, and this is what we've had from the beginning. Now, the church fathers will teach this, and they talk about heretics coming along and cutting things out of the canon, or maybe adding to it. And so the three main heretics uh, that we're concerned with in this particular study was Marcion, Tashian, and the Ebionites. It was interesting, the other day I was looking something up, and I found a group that are actually modern-day Marcionites, trying to bring back his teachings. And I thought, wow, that's interesting. Because there's a prophecy out of 3 Corinthians, again, not to be added to the canon, but probably something you might want to read. But there's a prophecy in 3 Corinthians, the only real extra piece of information in it, is that this Gnostic junk that was there in the first century would come back toward the end of time. So we have the party of the circumcision coming back, which is hyper Hebrew roots. We have Gnosticism coming back, and we see that all over the internet. But the Marcionites, that's what's interesting. Uh, each had their own canons of scripture by cutting out portions of scripture to get rid of the evidence that con contradicted their teachings. And so here's an example here. So Marcion, he rejected the Old Testament. The entire Old Testament is written by some evil God that has nothing to do with Jesus and salvation. So the Jews are out throughout the Old Testament. We're just going to do the New Testament. But he uh, also uh, used Luke, the Gospel of Luke. But Luke is all about the birth of Christ and everything. So he used a cut-up version of taking out references to Jesus being creator because he didn't like that. So all the references, it's just a, a watered down version of Luke. He also used some of Paul's epistles, but he cut out pieces of them that he didn't like. And he created the gospel of Paul. And, and we still have pieces of these things. And so people that don't know the history, and this is all written by the church fathers. So it's, it's out there. It's been out there for centuries. Someone will dig up the Gospel of Judas, the Gospel of Paul, Gospel of Mary. You know, those are all Gnostic works put out by cults. It's a bunch of garbage. And according to them, this is that way. Now, this was thought to be, for the longest time, the church fathers really just not liking the other denomination. Nobody's really that bad, you know. Uh, Nazis are never that bad, you know, they're you know, that kind of thing. But in 1948... The Nag Hammadi Library was discovered, and it's the Gnostic Library and the Gnostic Gospels and all that stuff in Nag Hammadi, Egypt. Sure enough, those people are just as bad as we thought they were, or we've been told they were. So that's Marcion. Tashian, actually, he's an interesting story. Tashian created the Encratites, which is a Gnostic denomination in the first or second century. Um, the Apostle John taught Polycarp worked with Polycarp for years in ministry. Polycarp had two disciples, Justin Martyr, two main disciples, Justin Martyr and Irenaeus. Fantastic books that those guys wrote. And it's cool to have eyewitnesses of Polycarp and 
testifying they occasionally saw john things like that but justin martyr uh one of his disciples was this guy here tashian and he seemed to be a good christian one of the things that he did was he created something called the diatessaron a diatessaron is simply a harmony of the gospels so you take all four gospels and make a harmony of them just kind of combine everything into one did an excellent job and we have the diatess run in the church father archive so you can get it and read it it's pretty cool but later on he apostatized he becomes very violent in nature uh forms what's called the encratites or the self-perfected ones they think they can basically save themselves through gnostic meditation you know the whole nine yards so when he does this he creates his own canon so it says and in the chart here he used a cut up version of the harmony of the gospels which is the diatessaron with references of christ's divinity removed again they don't like christ being god it seems like that's the one thing all the cults have in common no trinity no deity of christ it was more than that he cut a lot of stuff out but that was the main idea so if you pick up a diatess from today it may or may not be the original for the longest time the eastern church like eastern orthodox in, in europe the eastern church for i think several centuries they used the diatess run instead of the four gospels but when this became kind of really messed up and floating around they basically all decided to go back to the four gospels and not use the diatess run so he rejected all of Paul's epistles, calling Paul totally apostate. And he did use the second Clement. First Clement and the recognitions of Clement are amazing. Second Clement may or may not have been legit, but again, he's just going to use it to try to teach things he likes, that kind of thing. And then there's the Ebionites. The Ebionites were uh, founded, I'm trying to think, by the guy named Ebion, who was partnered with another guy who was a Sadducee. And those two actually were at the Acts 15 council, according to the church fathers. So when it says some people supposedly came down from James, saying you can't be saved unless you uh, get circumcised and, and do the law of Moses, and this they're, they're causing this big debate. And James said, well, first off, I never sent anybody to say anything like that. But as far as the issue, let's, and then you have the whole thing in, in, that, in chapter 15. So Ebion and I can't remember the other guy's name, but they got together and formed the Ebionite gospel. Okay. So the gospel of the Ebionites, also called the gospel of the Hebrews. So they used a cut up version of the gospel of Matthew in Hebrew and called it the gospel of the Hebrews. Now, sometimes when you're reading church fathers, they'll talk about how cool the gospel of the Hebrews is. They're referring to the Hebrew version of Matthew, because when you read it in Hebrew, you'll notice things that you don't in Greek, and it's just really cool. But it's Matthew. It's the same exact thing. But then there is a Gnostic book of Matthew. So the Gospel of the Ebionites is, is what it's usually called to differentiate the two. So sometimes you'll find a church father saying that the, the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew is corrupt. It's horrible. And then other times you'll say, no, no, it's really cool. They're talking about two different books. But in each of these cases, we're talking about, we're going to cut up either Luke, the Diatessaron, or Matthew. So those are good Bible, the, the Gospels. And he rejects all of Paul's epistles, saying Paul's apostate. Today we have people that are hyper-dispensational, that say we shouldn't read the the Gospels, because that's Jesus' work with the Jews. It's actually the finishing part of the Old Testament. So nothing Jesus says really has any bearing on us, and even part of Acts. But at a certain part, like Acts 13 or 15 or somewhere, then we start paying attention to it, and we, we follow the epistles of Paul. We also don't pay any attention to Hebrews and a couple of others, because that's for a later time. That's hyper-dispensationalism, and that's absolutely ridiculous. Because even in the epistles of Paul that they explain, uh, or that they accept, he explains that everything is written for our learning. The entire canons, both both of the, the entire contents of both canons, and the Dead Sea Scrolls and everything else is written for your understanding. 
Okay, so you don't just throw something out like that. And remember, we've got one of the Dead Sea Scrolls saying that this Apostle Paul, this Benjamite, is going to be the, the uh, Apostle to the Gentiles. And when Paul went before James and said, you know the prophecy, I'm a Benjamite, you know what I've been doing, here's what's happened and how the Lord has blessed it. And you look at the evidence, obviously nobody, no other Benjamite, you know, is doing anything like this. And the Lord is blessing you. People are coming, Gentiles are coming to the Lord. Obviously, you're the one prophesied. So you are the apostle to the Gentiles. We're going to give you the right hand of fellowship and very proud to finally meet you. The guy that we've been, you know, studying about for centuries. But it's really cool to see this. So that being the case, if the Dead Sea Scrolls tell you the answer to all of your questions about the law and things like that are in the epistles of Paul, just go study the epistles of Paul. Even if you study nothing else, memorize the epistles of Paul. I mean, other than if you throw Hebrews in there, uh, other than Hebrews, Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, those are the big ones. The rest of them are really small and you can like read them a hundred times in, in, in a year, but make sure you understand them really well. They have the answers to everything. So we definitely don't want anybody that rejects Paul. And we have some of the Hebrew roots people that do that these days. Paul is apostate. He, we don't do anything with Paul. We're going to cut that out of the canon. Well, if you say anything like that, basically what you're saying is that the prophets of old didn't know what they were doing. But it gets back to this idea again, lost books of the Bible or people putting things out of the Bible or putting things into the Bible. And this is the concept. So with this in mind, let me, we'll finish our study. I want to show you one other thing. So there's something called a Muratonian canon fragment. And it's just called that because it was an uh, Italian guy, Muratoni, who found the canon or the canon fragment. It's thought to be uh, written by Caius because there's other documents that talk about he did something like this. So it may or may not have been written by Church Father Caius. He was a disciple of one of the disciples of Irenaeus, if I remember correctly, who was a disciple of Polycarp who worked with John. So pretty interesting. So anyway, notable points in this thing, we're going to look at this, but there always seems to have been only four Gospels, those written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So according to this document, if there is another one, like the Gospel of Paul or the Gospel of Mary or Gospel of Judas, Apparently it's fake, because there's always have been and always will be only four Gospels. Why? I don't know, but that's just what it says. It also says there's one book of church history, how everything got started, and we call it the Acts of the Apostles, or Acts for short. And it mentions that there are, it mentions 13 of the 14 books written by Paul. That doesn't necessarily mean that the other one is not inspired. We'll get to that in a minute. It also mentions one epistle, a real epistle of Paul, written to the Laodiceans. But it also says that there are forged copies, forged epistles, fake ones, to Laodicea and Alexandria. So we have Laodicea and Alexandria. Uh, Alexandria is obviously a forgery. Laodicea may or may not be the original one. Seems to be awful, awful small. Remember when we're at the end of... Um, Colossians. It says, have this epistle read in uh, the, the Colossi epistle, Colossians, read in Laodicea, and make sure you guys read the epistle that I sent to Laodicea so that you understand I'm not telling one person one thing and some something else to someone else. It's the same gospel. And so if you can find Laodiceans, again, that's the whole thing. We're not going to add to the canon, but if the canon says there is one, Look at it. The one that you find might be one of the fake ones. So you always got to, you know, take it with a grain of salt. It has to agree with the New Testament. So anyway, but there's there's forged ones. He mentions Luke and at least two epistles of John, the gospel, or I mean, the revelation of John. There's also a gospel of Peter, I mean, a revelation of Peter and Paul and stuff like that. Well, they'll get into that. Um, let's see. And they accept none of the Gnostic books, so they begin to tell you who these are. So let's just look at this. So 
Um, Matthew and Mark, what they would have said about Matthew and Mark is not there because, again, it's a fragment. The first part and the last part's been ripped off. So he says something about Matthew and Mark because he says the third gospel is that according to Luke. So if, if we start off saying that there's a third gospel called Luke and a fourth gospel called John, obviously there was Matthew and Mark even though we're, you know, so all it says, we're probably talking about Mark, and it says, nevertheless, he was present, and so he placed it in his narrative. So everything is based on eyewitness accounts. Whatever we're talking about, I don't know, but something to do with Mark. So we've had a Matthew and a Mark, then we go to Luke. The third book of the gospel is that according to Luke. Luke, the well-known physician, wrote it in his own name. It is widely believed that he wrote it after the ascension of Christ when he was traveling with the Apostle Paul. Luke had great zeal for making sure all the information was completely correct. It is true that he had not seen the Lord in the flesh. Luke wasn't one of the twelve disciples. Yet, having ascertained the facts, he, will, he was able to begin his narrative with the nativity of John. So other, other places talk about, you know, they talk to Mary, they talk to, you know, anybody that was around at the time and pulled these things together. On a side note, this is interesting. There was a church father called, um, my mind's blown, I think it was Hagasippus. Yeah, Hagasippus that wrote a uh, five-volume commentary to the epistle, uh, to the uh, Gospels. So what he did, according to the church fathers, is he went around and he, he interviewed Mary, Jesus' mom, his brothers, his sisters, people that were in various synagogues at the time, people that knew him, people, you know, all the eyewitnesses. And in doing that, he wrote this commentary, just lots of extra details, five-volume commentary on just the four Gospels. I would love to get that thing and read it. It would really be an eye-opener, I would think. But it's one of those things that, uh, as far as I know, has been lost to us in history. Okay, so that's Luke. So now John, or the Gospel according to John. Eh. Okay, here we go. The fourth Gospel is that according to John, who was one of Jesus' disciples. In response to an exhortation of his fellow disciples and bishops, he said, Fast with me for three days, then let us tell each other what should be revealed to each one. So in other words, I'm going to put the basic narrative together, and I want us to fast and pray and see if you remember things. The Holy Spirit, like Jesus said, would bring it to our mind. Maybe I've forgotten an important piece. And let's decide what should be the most important parts and put them together. So he asked the disciples this. The same night it was revealed to Andrew, who was one of the apostles, that it should be John who should relate this in his own name. So that's why we have the gospel according to St. John. Uh, they all acting as correctors. So that's cool. So the Gospel of John is not because John went a little kooky, went Gnostic, you know, because it talks about the Logos entering the world and things like that. This was edited by the 12 apostles. So the 12 apostles all agree, yes, this is cons consistent teaching. Jesus is the Logos, the Word of God. He was with God the Father, and he was God. And he can't, you know, all that stuff. So it's got the stamp of approval of all the 12 apostles. And that's pretty cool. Um, let's see here. Uh, so John would do it in his own name. They would be correctors. Uh, that way, there would be no discord, even though different selections would be given from the facts and in individual books of Gospels, and the faith of the believers would be secure. You don't want any people saying that there's the John version and the Matthew version, and I'm going to be a Matthewite, and if you're a Johnite, I don't like you, or that kind of thing. We actually see this beginning in the epistles of John with uh, Diotrephes. He wouldn't let John or any anybody from John's group even enter his church. 
you know, remember that situation. So that's what they're trying to avoid, that kind of stuff. Because in all of them, under one guiding spirit, all these things relating to his nativity, his passion, his resurrection, conversation with his disciples, his twofold advent, the first and the second comings, the first in humiliation rising from contempt, which took place, and the second in the glory of his kingly power yet to come, should all be declared. What marvel it is then that John's bring forth so consistently in his epistles, saying these things that in person, the things that we have seen with our eyes, heard with our ears, and that our hands have uh, handled, those things we've written. Eyewitness testimony. John professes not only to be an eyewitness, but also a hearer and a narrator of the wonderful, wonderful things that the Lord did in their order. So that's a fantastic explanation of the Gospel of John. That is just really cool. So then we get to Acts. Remember the things that that Benjamite was going to do. Moreover, the Acts of the Apostles was written by Luke. Again, not an eyewitness, but studied with that Benjamite guy. In one book, for the most excellent Theophilus, Luke wrote about the individual events that took place in his presence. So there's not a whole lot about certain things, like Paul's last missionary journey is not recorded in uh, the book of Acts, or Paul's and Peter's death not recorded in the book of Acts, because Luke was not there. We have that in other documents. Again, not to be added to the canon, but it's interesting to have the rest of the story. Anyway, he goes on and he says, uh, the, the book of Acts then, he clearly shows that he's only writing things that he was there present by omitting the crucifixion of Peter and the departure of Paul when Paul went from the city of Rome to Spain. That was the, the final uh, fourth missionary journey, the one that's not recorded in the book of Acts. We have a record of that too, so that's cool. But again, this is... Um, this lets you know that those events that are speculated on actually did happen. But anyway, the book of Acts is scripture. And then we get to Paul's epistles. So it says, now Paul's epistles, uh, what they are about and to whom they are written is clear to anyone who reads them. You know, like the Romans, it's written to the city of Rome about Roman stuff. Pretty self-explanatory. But first of all, Paul wrote at length, and those are pretty big books, uh, to the Corinthians to correct their heretical system. Then he writes to Galatians to forbid circumcision, forbidding Christians to join the party of the circumcision. We're not going to be Hebrew roots. We want to be Messianic. We want to be Christians. Then after that, he writes to the Romans on the order of the Old Testament scriptures showing that Christ is their chief matter in them. So it's a witnessing tool to, to pagan Rome. Each of which is necessary for us to discuss, seeing that the blessed apostle Paul himself, following the example of John, writes to no more than seven churches by name. It's interesting that John wrote to the seven churches in, in the book of Revelation, and Paul wrote to seven churches by name. In the following order, Corinthians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Galatians, Thessalonians, and Romans, to those cities, the people in those cities. But he writes twice for the sake of correction to the Corinthians and to the excuse me, Thessalonians. Okay, it is shown by these seven epistles that there is one church spread throughout the whole earth. Isn't that cool? We're brothers. I don't care what denomination you are, as long as you accept Jesus and him crucified. We're brothers. There's one church, one universal church. That's where we get the term Catholic. Catholic means universal. I'm not Roman Catholic in any way, shape, or form. I'm Calvary Chapel. But because of that, I'm Catholic. I'm universal. I believe that we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. You might be sinning, and if I find out, I'll correct you, and we might have an argument. But it doesn't change the fact that you're a believer and I'm a believer, if you really are a believer. So, there's a universal church spread throughout the entire earth. 
Uh, likewise, John also in the Apocalypse writes to seven churches, and he speaks to us all through them. He wrote out of affection and love one epistle to Philemon, one to Titus, and two to Timothy. So that's all of those. Uh, he ha- These are held sacred by the universal church in the regulation of ecclesiastical discipline. So you want to know how a church should work? The epistles of Paul. If your church is not following the epistles of Paul, you're slightly out of line. Now, we can debate on exactly how that should be, but that should be your motivation. If you can say, well, yeah, Paul said we do communion this way, but we're going to do it differently, you're out of line. I don't know if it's important or not, but we're supposed to be running the church the way that the epistles mention. Okay, so now we get to forgeries. He says there are circulating one epistle to the Laodiceans and one to the Alexandrians forged in the name of the Apostle Paul against the heresy of Marcion. Remember, we just looked at the Marcion stuff. Let me run back here real quick. Marcion rejects the Old Testament, used a cut-up version of Luke about Jesus not being the creator, cuts up some versions of Paul's epistles, so I can see why Paul might start, you know, doing that kind of stuff. And he creates the gospel of Paul. Yeah, right. Among these other things. And to study those cults are kind of interesting. But anyway, for our study tonight. So, and, and I make a note in here that Colossians 4 shows that there's a real epistle to Laodicea also. Okay. So there are many others which cannot be received into the universal church for it's not fitting that gall be mixed with honey. So there's four Gospels, there's one book of history, the book of Acts, and then there's these uh, 14 epistles of Paul, and then we can debate on some of the others, but that's the, the nutshell. So if you have another Gospel, it's fake. I don't care who wrote it or what it is, or it's it's fake. Unless it's somebody, you know, like like Tashian originally doing a diatessaron, if you're going to make a, com- a commentary or make a harmony of the Gospels, or it's all based on the four Gospels. So there's lots of those, and they may or may not have good stuff in them. But there aren't. there's no other Gospels. There's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and that's it, according to this. Okay, and there's 14 epistles of Paul. There's no Gospel of Paul. There's no uh, epistle of Barnabas. Uh, well, there's an epistle of Barnabas that's later, but uh, there's no gospel of Barnabas that's a Gnostic work, things like that. So we've got to be careful. And no matter what it is, even if it's a legitimate book, it's not to be added to this canon. That was the main idea. So general epistles, it says, further, we have an epistle of Jude. So that's legit. That's Jude. Uh, two bearing the name of John are counted among the general epistles. I thought that was interesting. I don't know if they just decided 3 John is just too personal. It's all about Diotropes and the weird guy. doesn't say anything about what he did. John just says, I'll correct it when I come. I I like having it in our canon. But anyway, so there's at least two that are counted general, among the general epistles, rather. Uh, Wisdom, written by the friends of Solomon in his honor, I'm thinking this is a typo because he could have been talking about the Old Testament and the Old Testament is closed. And then there's additional books that some of them are really cool. Like one is the wisdom of Solomon. It's mainly all about staying away from idols. So it's all practical, good knowledge. So I don't know. I think somebody slipped the digit and wrote this in here. But anyway, it's nice to know that they knew about it and thought it was a good book. But anyway, um, we received the apocalypses of John and Peter only. However, some do not wish the apocalypse of Peter to be read in church. So that makes me think that Peter's apocalypse got added to or garbled or something. We have an apocalypse of Peter in the Church Father Archive, and it seems like, you know, a fake, like, like the real Laodiceans and a fake Laodiceans. Seems like what we have is not legit. But anyway, but we definitely have the Apocalypse of John. So early on, everybody accepted the revelation of John. So then we have non-inspired, okay? So Hermas 
wrote The Shepherd. That's part of one of the apocryphal uh, books, The Shepherd of Hermaeus. You probably heard of it. But the, so there's this guy named Hermas who wrote The Shepherd in the city of Rome, most recently in our times. Well, then it doesn't qualify to be scripture in that sense if it's past the time of the closing. And he wrote this when his brother, Bishop Pius, was occupying the chair at the Church of Rome. So it was a brother of a Roman Catholic, or I mean, a, a bishop from Rome. So it indeed ought to be read. It's it's a good. It's got some good stuff in it if you want to read that stuff. But that it be made public to the people in church and placed among the prophets whose number is complete, canons closed, or among the apostles. It's not possible to the end of time, or at least to the end of our age that kind of thing. Nothing's going to be added to the canons. So this tells us several things. Number one, that they have the canon, the Old and the New Testament, and it's read in public to people in the church. And that there's a list of, of those books. There's the prophets and the apostles, the basic gospel, and we don't add to them in the sense of teaching them in church. So like at a Calvary chapel, what we're doing is going Genesis to Revelation, and we kind of start over again. That's the only thing we focus on, because that's what we're here for. Now, we might turn around and say, well, now, Josephus gives this interesting comment, or Jasher, or one of the other texts say this, and if that's true, it might have been like this. So commentaries are fine, but you wouldn't actually stop on a Sunday morning and study the Apocalypse of Peter, even if it was legit. You want to stick to just the books of the Bible, just the 66. So that we're seeing this right here. So the shepherd thing might be a really good tree to see. It might be, have some really good stuff in it. But that we read it in church as a canonical book? No, not going to happen. So and then we have um, the, and I've got other lists uh, of the church fathers. They have different things in here, but. Uh, the Gnostic cults, and he's going to start talking about the Gnostics now, but we miss some of it. So we reject anything written by Arsenus, Valentinus, or Miltidides. Uh, Mil we also reject those who wrote the New Book of Psalms, Marcion, Basilides, and the founder of the Asian, Asian Cataphrygians. And, you know, we can study those. Those are all Gnostic cults. We know exactly who they were and what they taught. And, yeah, as a Christian church, I would reject Mormons, Mormon theology. I would reject Jehovah Witness theology. I would reject, you know, uh, Jim Jones, Guyana Temple stuff. I'll, there's a lot of cults out there, a lot of them. And I would reject, I wouldn't want to read anything from them because it might get confusing. You don't want to confuse people. We're supposed to be making disciples, and you don't want uh, new believers to get confused. You know, it's easiest to do that. So stick with scriptures is what he's saying. But these are definitely to be rejected because they're cults. I don't have any part of the new book of Psalms, but I know the guy that wrote it and some of the other things that he wrote. So now, and with that, we'll end with this, but here's just a real quick list. We have... Uh, Athanasius, who wrote about the, what should be in the canon in 400, Eusebius did in 325, Hippolytus, Irenaeus, Origen, Tertullian, um, Clement of Alexandria, the Maturian Onian canon fragment, that's what we just read, talks about what is and is not there. And then you've got old books like the Sinaiticus, Vaticanus, Alexandrius, and some of the others, and they're all compared here. So the four Gospels, in all of them, no more than four Gospels, one book of Acts, in all of them, epistles of Paul, as far as like the, the not looking at Hebrews, but the other epistles of Paul, they're all there, okay? So the epistle of Philemon uh, is not mentioned by Irenaeus or Hippolytus. They didn't say that it's not supposed to be there. They just said, here's a list of stuff. So they either didn't like it or it just didn't get added to the list. So who knows? But we're looking for someone to say, this is trash. This should not be in the Bible. And nobody says that about Philemon. And the rest of everybody has Philemon. 
The book of Hebrews, yeah, it's not mentioned by Irenaeus, Hippolytus, or Tertullian. I don't know why. It's just not mentioned. They didn't say anything bad about it, but it's mentioned in a lot of the others. Hebrews is not mentioned directly in the Maturionian canon fragment either, what we just read. So we've got the book of James, and you can see here, 1st, 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. Some people did not have 3rd John. And again, the, the canon fragment we just looked at, it didn't say that it's fake. It just says that there's two, or at least two, epistles of John. But the two, everybody agrees on. That's basically what they're saying. And the book of Jude, I think everybody agreed on Jude. Well, Hippolytus didn't mention it, but everybody. Now, Origen and Eusebius, these Ds here, they're basically saying there's some people that want to dispute them. And they don't say who. I'm thinking maybe Gnostics. We remember what happened with James. Uh, in this case, the book of James. Um, in um, When Luther was putting together his Bible, he said the book of James is, James is a right straw epistle without, without one ounce of gospel in it. He didn't like the idea of works of salvation. And we always get confused on that. But what happened is, He's using a Latin Vulgate uh, version of his, of his teachings before he creates his Bible. Now, the Latin Vulgate text that he was using actually comes out and says, you're saved by your works. It's kind of like mistranslated when they put it into the Latin. If that's what the true book of James says, I would agree with Luther. It's a right straw epistle without one ounce of gospel in it get rid of it. But that's one Latin manuscript. All the other manuscripts in Greek, in Georgian, in Coptic, in um, Syriac, you know, all the other languages, they all say the same thing that our Greek, our basically King James does, that you prove your salvation by your works. You're not saved by works. So it's a misunderstanding. So like if, if Luther... Martin Luther can make a mistake like that just because he's looking at one set of manuscripts and not all of them. I could see where he would do that. So I could see other people doing that for James too, possibly 2 Peter, 3rd, 2nd, 3rd John, uh, and maybe Jude because of what it's saying. Tertullian says that Jude was written specifically against the Copacratian Gnostics. So we'll do a study on Jude sometime, but it's pretty interesting. We'll go ahead and stop here with this. I just wanted to do a quick, brief understanding of this. So in other words, the teaching handed down by all the church fathers and the rabbis, we didn't look at it because there's a ton of them, but uh, the teaching is that Moses writes five books. He proves himself to be a prophet by all the, the miracles and things that happen. See, not that he can do anything, but the ten plagues, the Egyptian exodus, you know, all that stuff. So the prophets prove themselves by doing something or multiple things, and they add to the canon. And then Ezra, who is a prophet used of God to bring the children back after the Babylonian captivity, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, closes the canon. And everybody after that accepts the fact that the canon is closed. But he had, you know, there's other temple library things. And then we have prophecies from the from the testaments about the Messiah writing stuff when the age of grace occurs. The history will be recorded and this Benjamite that'll write a series of epistles uh, explaining everything. So you got the Dead Sea Scrolls telling you if you're confused on anything, go read the epistles of Paul. Now today we argue what Paul actually meant. And so I'm going to tell you, study Paul thoroughly, and then to find the answers on what Paul meant, go back to the scrolls. And then you'll learn what the problems were. And then you can say, well, if that's what the problem was, and that's what he's referring to, then okay, I get it. So that's what we want to do. So um, basically, there is no um, lost gospels. There are no lost acts. There are no lost epistles. But we have the ones that are inspired. And anything that says the same thing that they say is redundant. We don't need it. Anything that contradicts what they say is obviously wrong. 
Anything that gives more information might be useful, like Josephus talking about how the Romans came and how many divisions there were and how they attacked. And some of that might be useful, you know, but it's not super important. And I hope you liked this. This is basically just a nice um, explanation of, you know, to be careful of all those other gospels and stuff like that. And if you actually do sit down and read them, you'll notice major discrepancies between them and the four Gospels. So pretty straightforward. Anyway, I'll go ahead and say good night. Thank you guys uh, very, very much. And we'll see you next time.